Hey everybody, uh, David Fine here from Keys Mods. This is gonna be uh, probably my most controversial video. I'm certain I'll get comments on here that are negative, but um, I'm actually open to your opinions because I don't think I have everything in life figured out. But today's video is going to be on the topic of collecting butterflies and moths. So, you know me, I'm a collector. And I catch moths and butterflies and we mount the wings and we put labels on them. Now, morally, ethically, wrong or right, you decide. You got to watch the video to see the way I think about this. Uh, guys, check this video out and we're going to have a discussion on the ethics of collecting insects. Check it out. Okay, so how did this begin? Like, How did it start with me? Why do I catch bugs? Why do I have thousands of butterflies and moths, mostly moths, in my living room. Well, first of all, I have an amazing wife who puts up with it. That's number one. Thank you, Noemi, for putting up with me, <laughs> my, my sickness. When I was eight years old, my father showed me, uh, he had a box, a Tupperware, something like this. And inside of the Tupperware were, he opened the Tupperware, were all of these little envelopes full of butterflies and moths. And he grew up in Zambia. What a cool childhood this guy had. He actually, his parents were missionaries. He was born in a little tiny village in what was then Ndola, but now current day Zambia. And he had an amazing childhood. And when he was in school, his principal had a big butterfly collection. So him and his brother thought it was the coolest thing in the world. They made nets. The principal taught them how to, you know, spread the wings on a butterfly and this and that. And they would go out and catch butterflies. And so uh, when he came to the States, he brought with him a Tupperware uh, of butterflies in envelopes because it was really tough to bring a big mounted box full of mounted specimens. Uh, it would be a lot easier to bring a little Tupperware and you can fit hundreds of them in there. So uh, one by one, he would take these specimens and open the envelope and he would pull them out. And now it had been 20 years or 15 years at least since he had collected it. And he's like, oh, I remember this one. This was on Dola Hill. And we used to walk up Dola Hill, which was not far from where we lived. And there was all these hair streaks and Dola Hill. Oh, and this one, this was a Chiraxes that we found. And we would actually go and follow, follow prides of lions around and wait for them to poop because they love carnivore poop and they would, the butterflies, these Traxy butterflies would come to the poop. Like he had these stories surrounding these butterflies and they were beautiful. Like this is a Catocala moth, but look at the pink on there. So he would pull these butterflies out. And as he was telling me the stories, like this, this fascination as an eight year old boy, I, I just, I just pictured myself in Africa. I had no idea what it looked like, but I just pictured myself there following a pride of lions around looking for butterflies. I mean, like, it was just like, there's something about it that tapped into my, my, my soul. And I, I said, Let, make me a net. Let's go. I, I got to do this. So he made me a net. We started going out in the backyard and little, little vacant fields and stuff like that and catching butterflies that went, that actually drove me into the sciences, which was interesting. I had, you know, it wasn't necessarily going into the sciences, but that drove me into biology because when you start learning the intricacies of how to find a butterfly or moth or beetle or whatever, you start to learn about its host plants. You start to learn about its predator prey relationships. You learn seasons, times of year, how the weather impacts them, how the, the, the different ecosystems, uh, things that make the populations go up and down, like all these things all come because you're studying them and you're looking for them. And in order to be successful lepidopterist, You've got to know about your your creature. You got you have to know what plant does this thing feed on. If I go find that plant, there's a better likelihood that I'll find the, the butterfly. And so, you know, when we when I started this, I started collecting, and I loved finding new things. And it was such a like I love the hunt, love going out in the field with my net, catching them and pinning them. And my dad was always careful to sh share with me, hey, just take like two or three of each kind. Like you don't need any more than that. And so 
for the most part, I followed that for most of my childhood because I didn't have, I didn't have space to put thousands and thousands of butterflies in. And so I did that. And um, when I started reaching like college age, I started to want to like expand and go like, I need to go because I pretty much found most of the butterflies that lived in the state of Florida by that time, back in the 1990s. Um, you know, there's maybe one or two that I still haven't found. A rogo skipper. I want to find the rogo skipper. I still haven't found that one. Um, and the Zestos skipper, which is now gone. Zestos is is extirpated from Florida, and I'll, I I don't know if I can ever get that one. Somebody gave me a specimen, but I I will never find that one for myself. So I started going to other places, going to you know going to California, Texas, Colorado, you know the Carolinas, Georgia, all these different places, looking for different things, always new things. Fast forward, um, probably 2000, or right around the 2000 area time. So that's now 24 years ago. It's 2024 right now. So 24 years ago, um, I started to get like, okay, this seems like it's uh, very, almost like self-absorbed, self-centered. And I, I started to feel, I want to give back. I want this to be something that can be used not just for me, for my own collection that I can look at and enjoy for myself, but because uh, it's more of a, it's like a pride thing. Instead, what if I were to um, give back? So I got involved with uh, the Southern Lepidoptera Society, which is a great society of butterfly and moth enthusiasts from the Southeast United States. Check it out, um, Lepsoc, Southern Lepsoc. Uh, I'll give you the link down here in my description to the website. Join. It's like 20 bucks a year. You get a couple of newsletters and you meet new people that love these things that are smarter than you and I. There's a lot of people that are smarter than me and you get to glean from their years of wisdom from this, this hobby. And so, uh, but anyway, now uh, I decided, I found out that, that the moths of the, of the Florida Keys have never been studied, not comprehensively. There's been people that have done little projects, but nothing like, okay, how do we know what, what lives in the Florida Keys? What moth species live in the Florida Keys? Butterflies are well known. They fly during the day. People put gardens out. They take pictures. Everybody loves butterflies. So butterflies are a lot more comprehensive in what we know about them. Not complete, but much more so. Uh, but moths fly at night. Some of them are really tricky to find. Even if you have lights, they don't all come to lights. So uh, it, it, for 24 years, 20, no, 22 years, I've been down the Florida Keys with a permit, permitted research project with the United States uh, the Fish and Wildlife, and they let me into some of their refuges and I collect moths. And so, yes, I kill them. I collect them, we kill them. Not everything that flies, it's not if it flies, it dies. Okay, it's not like that, but it's very, it's, it's selective. And we take the specimens that are interesting scientifically. I preserve them. And you can see, I'll, I'll show you, hold up a little box right here of uh, things that I'm donating to the museum. And so now, last year I donated over 800 specimens to the Florida State Collection of Arthropods up in Gainesville with the McGuire Center. And, you know, these specimens are, are really valuable. We're finding new species. We're finding things that are unknown to science. And so... Um, so you, you, you let me know, comment down below. Is it, we're finding new things. We're finding things that have never seen, never before been seen by human eyes. Uh, when I found the uh, dingy purple wing, I found dingy purple wing uh, caterpillar c cluster. And it was so cool that find like 200 dingy purple wing caterpillars. I'm, we're going back like, like 18 years now. But I took this cluster home. It's like a big web. It almost looks like a gypsy moth, uh, like tent, like a tent caterpillar cluster or something like that. Took it home and raised them through on Gumbo Limbo, their native host plant. And what we found was that the, the, the females of the dingy purple wing have two forms. And I'd never found any research on that because probably wild caught dingy purple wing females, they, they, get worn really quickly and it, the, 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 the difference is subtle. And so there's actually a, a, a form that has metallic blue sheen on it. And in fact, let me, 
Unica, 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 Unica. Guys, check this out. This is my drawer full of Unica and Mycelia. I'm gonna show you something real quick. All right, everybody, this, this drawer is pretty cool. I've got Florida Purple Wings here, which are super cool. But the dingy purple wing, guys, Unica Monoma up here, uh, they are dingy looking, but when you hit it the, with the light, with the right angle, you can see some iridescent purple. From here over, these are all males, and the males only have one form from what I saw, and they have this metallic bluish purple sheen on the wings. These are all fresh Unica Monoma, dingy purple wings. The females have two forms. This one, and, and here's the thing, out of like 90 specimens of female Unica Monoma, they came out 45 that came out in one form and 45 came out in the other form. Uh, I, don't, I didn't keep them all, you know, I just kept a little series of each form. But this form has no, absolutely no iridescence whatsoever. Just drab brown coloration, okay? No purple. The other 45 had the iridescent purple. Now, that was, I couldn't find any literature that would show that. And we found that out through collecting the caterpillars, raising them through, getting to know them intimately. And when they are freshly emerged, we get to see these morphological differences, which is pretty cool. And that's an example of a scientific fact, even of a butterfly that's very well known, that I'm not sure I had re read or found anything that showed that the females of the dingy purple wing had two color forms. Now, I don't know why there's two forms. I don't know why there were, out of that brood, there was 90 females and I counted 45 were not iridescent, 45 were iridescent blue. And they're, they're actually the, the blue females are actually brighter blue than the males, which are pretty cool. So, uh, you know, like it or not, collecting a few, a few specimens of this species helped better understand it. And I wrote an article in the Southern Laps, it's probably 17 or 18 years ago, so, you know, <laughs> I have to go find it, but uh, very, very cool. And, you know, we're publishing these findings and donating specimens of, uh, especially the moths, because I don't do a whole lot of butterfly collecting. Um, I don't really have a need to. It's not something that, that I desire to do. Um, if there's something that's new or something that like I could get, like for a voucher specimen of a particular species that I don't have yet, I'll keep a, species, a specimen or two, but I'm not interested in going hunting for butterflies for my own personal collection. Uh, I am more interested in the moths because there's so much more scientifically that we can do with moths. So the ethics of that, you know, I have another video on how to euthanize a moth or butterfly specimen. Uh, it's one of my better hitting videos. I'll probably make another one because people like, people want to watch it for whatever reason. But, um, you know, we do so in, as humanely as possible. Um, you know, we use a kill jar with ethyl acetate. It's like, like one second when the one or two seconds when the moth is in the jar, it goes down. Uh, ethyl acetate has some really, really good knockdown power and it knocks them out quick. Um, the freezer is another way to, you know, cold blooded animals, these insects, they have, they, they just, their metabolism just slows down when the temperature drops and they just kind of go to sleep and, you know, leave them in the freezer for a couple of days. It's very painless. They don't they don't feel pain the same way we do. Uh, they don't have the brain to translate that kind of. So you know the ethics of that. They're not feeling pain. We don't. And and here's the thing, we 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 don't kill stuff. I I love breeding projects and releasing stuff. I bred a bunch of Palamedes swallowtails this past year just to document the life cycle and record it and do some videos on it. I released a ton of uh, Palamedes swallowtails. I don't need to kill Palamese swallowtails. Uh, so, you know, I, I love breed, breeding and releasing uh, butterflies. I love Atala relocation, the, the, the Kunti hair streak down here. You know, they were almost where well, they were thought to be extinct at one point. And the Kunti hair streak is a beautiful, uh, Atala is an incredibly beautiful butterfly. And they eat cycads, which people use as ornamental plants in landscapes. But when they find it, they decimate it. 
They, they tear the plant down and people are like, oh no, something's killing my plant. So they come out and spray it. And there's actually like a Facebook group that it's like, it's like a Tala adoption <laughs> where if, hey, if you have a Tala's, don't spray them. We'll come and get them. We'll relocate them. I'm down with that. That's, that's my kind of thing. And so, you know, um, I do believe that just harvesting large amounts of, of butterfly, that's not, we don't do that. We don't do that. You know, I, I love breeding projects. I love capturing a, a, a live female, have her lay eggs for us, and we'll document the life cycle. And you get to fresh, fresh, you know, reared specimens. I think that's a, a neat way to do it, where we're not going out into the wild and catching, you know, 20 females that are, have eggs. And, you know, one. You get one female, you get all the, you know, specimens you want, and you get to enjoy the life cycle as well. So I think that's better... Uh, add more advantageous scientifically, and uh, and that's just that's just the way I roll. I, you know, I, I like to do the life cycle work. Um, you know, some people might disagree with me. Some people might be like really hating on me right now. And um, you know, I love you. I love you back. <laughs> it's, it's 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 okay. I, I mean, I mean, it's um, it's I think it's a, a wrestle that that we have in our soul. Um, but I I know that um, as far as my approach. Um, I do care very dearly about our environment and I do the best to protect our environment. I think that we should protect our environment. I think that um, these, these creatures are disappearing and we need to respect these things. And if something is, something is imperiled and is really just hanging on by one little, two little habitat, we shouldn't touch it. We should not touch it. There's no reason to collect those things. So uh, that's my, those are my opinions. Um, take them for just that as opinions. I'd love to hear from you. Comment down below what you think. Um, but I, I am totally down with collecting for scientific research. And...